36th lecture, we are going to solve minor two papers, point out the mistakes that have been committed by you and uh, we want to conclude our discussion in oscillators at the end of the class. Question 1, I had to write it down because <coughs> those watching video uh, will have to know what the problem is. Question 1 was a class B, let me point out the, uh, the implications <coughs> as I go through. A class B BJT output stage with plus minus 12 volt power supplies produces a square wave and I underlined square. Despite the underlining, you applied Vm squared by 2 Rm, which is applicable only to sine wave because there the root mean squared value, there is Vm by root 2. I will come to that. I will come to that. It, that is not a square wave. I will tell you. In the context, it is a class B BJT and plus minus 12 volt supply, obviously it is a complementary pair. A single transistor class B is no good because it is a rectifier. Okay? And therefore, in the context, it should have been obvious that the excursions are plus 10, plus Vm and minus Vm. Some people asked me this question. So, I counter, uh, I posed a counter question. Can this be produced by the circuit that you have drawn? It cannot be. Square wave output voltage of amplitude Vm equal to 10 volts is slightly less than the power supply plus 12 across a load of 16 ohms. 16 ohms typically is two loudspeakers in series, typically. And obviously, if it is producing a square wave, obviously the class B stage has been overdriven. Agreed? It's a, it has been overdriven. Neglecting the effects of VBE on, this is to simplify the problem. VBE on and VC is set. VBE on means there is no crossover distortion and VC is set means that minus VC is set the output voltage is, uh, the maximum is VCC, okay, VBE on and VC is set. Determine the load power PL, the power dissipated in the transistor. I did not put an S. So, some people asked me, is it one transistor or two transistors? Well, if you can find in one transistor, obviously, the total power dissipation would be multiplied by 2. So, that is not a problem, <coughs> PD. But I intentionally preceded this, I put it at B. I should have, natural sequence would have been the power supplied P S and so the power dissipated would have been P D, uh, P S minus P L. But nevertheless, it can be calculated independently, P D. If you multiply V C E by cut, okay? And that, the whole thing has to be multiplied by 2 to get the total power dissipation, okay? Then, uh, the other, prob the other parts of the question are the efficiency eta under this condition that is 10 volt Vm and the, the maximum attainable eta and the corresponding Vm. This was simplicity itself. The answer is 100 percent and Vm should be equal to Vcc 12. <coughs> the value of Vm at which Pd is maximum this is the standard uh, thing. You write the expression for Pd in terms of Vm and maximize them. And this occurs at Vm equal to Vcc by 2 irrespective of whether it is sinusoidal output or square wave output, it does not matter. And the value of eta under the condition of F, obviously here it would be 50 percent because Vm is half of Vcc. Anyway, the solution as I said, <coughs> once you recognize that there are two power supplies and that it is a complementary class B a square wave output will mean this, not the other kind. It does not start from 0. If it starts from 0, then it is not a class B power amplifier. It is a rectifier and a rectifier serves no purpose as far as <coughs> a load of 16 ohms and amplification is concerned. Okay. So, this is the circuit and the solution. Ah, some people did not recognize the fact that the two transistors Q1 and Q2 do not uh, 
conduct simultaneously. Some people did not recognize this fact. Uh, this is a basic fact of a class P amplifier that half of the, uh, the, the positive half Q1 conducts, the negative half Q2 conducts and therefore, the power supplied is PS plus power supplied by this, this is for half the cycle and PS minus. It is as if 12 volt is supplying that current continuously instead of you see plus 12 volt comes into occurrence once, minus 12 comes into occurrence once, but for the total period it is as if 12 volt is supplying that amount of current. Now, the solutions are, I will simply go through these solutions. P L, the load power is instead of V m squared by 2 R L, it should be V m squared by R L, because as far as the load is concerned, the voltage is 10 volt V m, whether it is plus or minus, that depends on which transistor is conducting. So, when you take the square, it becomes all plus and this is 100 divided by R L is 16, so many watts. So, this is 6.25 watts. Some people for P D, they took the power supplied or oh, that is obviously wrong. Some people put P D as equal to the power supplied by the batteries and then they found out P S as P L plus P D. P S equal to P L plus P D is ok, but identification of P D is a problem. This is V C E multiplied by V M divided by R L and that comes as 1.25 watt for two transistors, for the two transistors. Those who put for one transistor perfectly all right, I have not uh, deducted any marks. As far as P S is concerned, as I said, it is as if V C C is supplying the current V M by R L all the time and this comes as 7.5 watts and therefore, the efficiency is 6.25 divided by 7.5. Usually, it is expressed in percentage, so multiplied by 100 percent and this comes as 83.3 percent. The maximum eta obviously will be reached when V m is equal to V c c. Therefore, V c c squared by R l would be P l and P s would also be V c c squared by R l and therefore, and therefore, eta is equal to 100 percent. Eta max is 100 percent when V m is equal to V c c equal to 12 volt. Whether this is useful or not that is a different question. I will tell you how a square wave is also useful. <coughs> okay. uh, the other parts of the question is P d when is this maximum? P d is V m by R l times V c c minus V m squared divided by R l. That is the power supplied minus the load power and obviously, this is maximum if you differentiate P d with respect to V m and put it to 0, this is maximum when V m is equal to V c c by 2. This 2 factor comes because of differentiation of this and therefore, this is 6 volt and under this condition eta shall be very easy to see eta shall be 50 percent. That uh, concludes question 1. It was a 5 minute question, not more than that. Now, uh, there can be a question as to why uh, a square wave, I mean what is the utility of a square wave? What is the utility? We want, uh, if it is a speaker, we want the, uh, the input to be, the output to be a faithful amplification of the input. Now, if it is square, uh, what is the utility? Well, if your if your emphasis is on power output and not the quality as is usually the case with pop music <laughs> this may be useful number 2 you may not be interested in audio amplification you may not be interested in the sound quality you may be interested only in the noise okay or maybe this is a buzzer off and on off and on off and on and all that okay so there are utilities of such thing Number 3, even if you want pure uh, 
faithful amplification of the given speech or music, it is sometimes beneficial to overdrive a class P and then use a simple filter, a high pass filter to cut off the high frequency. So, you regain the original sine wave. There are uses of square wave output from a class B amplifier. The second question, <coughs> I do not think anybody got the answer, no one except one possibly, one got the answer correctly. Now, this is a this is a simple differential amplifier with the difference that we have used a 150 ohm resistance here and a 150 ohm resistance here in the emitters. They are before connection, they are symmetrical all right and the other, uh, other uh, modification is that there is no load in Q1, there is no resistance in Q1 and therefore, the output V0, this point as far as AC is concerned is grounded and therefore, the total differential output appears from the collector of Q2 to ground. Okay? This is the differential voltage. So, <coughs> it is an unbalanced to unbalanced voltage. This voltage is unbalanced because one terminal is grounded. The output is also unbalanced, one terminal is grounded. Now, this is a much more economic circuit as compared to forget about these two resistors. This is a much more economic circuit as compared to the ordinary differential equation, differential amplifier because one resistance is missing and this is a favorite differential amplifier for ICs where uh, you, you do not want a balanced output. If you want a balanced output then obviously, you have to put it here. The <coughs> why are these two resistances used? Usually, these are used to balance the two transistors, even if they are manufactured on the same die, okay, there may be small differences which cause offset voltages and to adjust that usually one uses a small resistance here and adjust the middle point. So, it is a usually a potentiometer like this, a small adjustment may be needed and this can be done during the processing itself or if it is a discrete stage of course, you can use a potentiometer. But one thing that is certain is that the collector current of Q1 and Q2, the DC collector currents, they do not depend upon the load. They only depend on VBE, I sub S e to the VBE by and VBE is obviously identical for both because as far as, as, far as DC is concerned, this is grounded, this is grounded, these two resistors are equal. And an equ and a, and a current source is here, so this current must be 0.25 milliampere, and this current must be 0.25 milliampere. Some of you wrote DC equations, which is obviously not necessary. We don't need it. We know the current. Why do we want this current? Because we want to find out GM. All right. Now, the usual half circuit analysis also holds here. If you recognize that you have to use a Vs by 2 here from the base with a negative polarity and then take the output from here, find out whatever the output is. That applies here also, but a simpler way once you look at this circuit, a very simple way would be to draw the equivalent circuit. Because of these differences that is there is no load here and our usual analysis says that the output is taken from here to here and half of this ap uh, appears from the collector to ground. Uh, obviously, the other half does not appear here because this is shorted, SC shorted and therefore, one should recognize that it may be easier to write the equivalent circuit by itself and you see how simple the equivalent circuit is. You have a Vs, then for Q1, you get an R pi 1. The two transistors are identical, identically biased. Therefore, I do not have to use R pi 1 and R pi 2. They should be the same. Nevertheless, let us use, use this and see what happens. R pi 1, then you have a 150 ohm and a 150 ohm. Now, from this point, there goes a current to generator a current source, a current source has an AC impedance of infinity okay? and therefore, this point is open. 
some people drew an equivalent circuit with the current source there. And when I, when I located one or two, I asked them, is it a DC current source or an AC current source? Now, they didn't get a hint. The, the mistake continued. Anyway, the other uh, part of the circuit is that there is a GM1 V pi 1 and this collector is grounded, okay, 150 ohm. Then <coughs> let, let's call this point as N, this node as N which is uh, connected to an infinite resistance to ground. And then you have uh, an R pi 2, the voltage is V pi 2 and this is a common base connection, in other words this is grounded, the base is grounded. And the other thing that appears here is G M 2 V pi 2, this this goes to RC, that is 20K, and this is V0. Let's call this as RE, and let's call this as RE. Now, if you write a, if you write a KCL at this node capital N, it's very easy to see well, let me write it V pi 1 by R pi 1 plus G M 1 V pi 1, okay. This is the current that comes here and the current that comes here is G M 2 V pi 2 plus V pi 2 by R pi 2 and this should be equal to 0. Now, since G M 1 R pi 1 are the same as G M 2 R pi 2, obviously V pi 1 is equal to minus V pi 2. You need not even write this equation. You can observe that the two sides are absolutely identical, okay. And therefore, V pi 1, there is no reason why V pi 1 and V pi 2 can, should not be identical. This is also a reflection of the fact that the differential voltage could be broken up into two parts V s by 2 and V s by 2 with opposite polarity, okay. So, V pi 1 is equal to minus V pi 2 and then what we do is we the next step that is the complete step. Next step is write a KVL around this loop, write a KVL around this loop. You see our V 0 you recognize that this is equal to minus G M 2. V pi 2 RC and therefore, if you can find out V pi 2, then the problem is solved. Now, if you write along this green line the KVL, then you get V s equals to V pi 1 plus the current through 150 ohms, which is V pi 1 by R pi 1 plus G m 1 V pi 1 multiplied by there are 2 Re's in series and therefore, the drop is multiplied by 2 Re and simply minus V pi 2. You also know that V pi 2 is equal to minus V pi 1 therefore, this is <coughs> plus V pi 1 and therefore, V s is equal to twice V pi 1. 1 plus G m r pi is beta. So, beta plus 1 divided by r pi multiplied by r e. That is it. You know v pi 1, therefore, you know v pi 2, therefore, you know v 0. You know v 0 by v s. And the final result is, is there any question here? Final result is after this algebra beta r c divided by 2 r pi plus beta plus 1 r e. Okay. All that I need now, yes. From the second to the third to this step, well v pi 2 is minus v pi 1 and our v 0, v 0 is minus g m v pi 2 r c. So, I substitute. I find V pi 1 from here, 
v pi 2 I put minus v pi 1 and substitute here. Okay. If you substitute the values all that I need to find out is r pi. So I know gm, gm is 25 millivolt divided by 0.25 milliampere. Is that right? Other way around. Yes. Dimensionally, this is making a mess. So, 0.25 divided by 25 millivolt, which is equal to 0 0.01 mo. And therefore, R pi is 100 divided by 0 0.01 ohms, which is equal to 10k. You substitute the values. And the gain comes out as a very simple and round number 40. I do not know why, how all these answers of 133.9, 67.62, I do not know how they came. For the gain, yes. Here. Yes. Is it necessary to make the assumption that VBE1 is equal to VBE2? <laughs> Since you did not do it, that does not justify that it should not be done. Okay. I sub C, okay. how can VBE1 and VBE2 differ? Q1 and Q2 are identical transistors, same beta, same beta their bases are similarly connected, emitters are similarly connected. There is no reason why the collector current should be different. Okay. Symmetry is the essence of life, although most of the things in life are asymmetrical. One tries to bring symmetry. That is why you see in Mughal architecture, everything is symmetrical. In electronic circuits also, symmetry helps. The third question, as I said, I could not think of a simpler question than this for feedback. I used a simple unbypassed common emitter circuit. And I also gave the hint, I also gave the hint uh, that uh, if you draw the equivalent circuit, everything should be clear everything should be clear. It may be a little difficult to recognize from here what kind of architecture it is and how to proceed, but you see what happens if I draw the equivalent circuit. The question was uh, this uh, unbypassed emitter resistance and in order to uh, simply divert your attention, I put a minus V E. I could have put a, put a ground here just like that, V C C and minus V E. If two supplies are available, you use the two supplies. I wanted architecture, what kind? I wanted you to draw the A circuit, the beta circuit and then V0 by Vs. There have been made Himalayan mistakes with regard to this. Some people have identified the gain without feedback as V0 by Vs. This is a mistake, unmistakable mistake. <laughs> okay. Why? Because the architecture is series, series. So the feedback gain should be current I0 prime divided by Vs prime. If you use V0 by Vs as this, then A by 1 plus A beta obviously would be quite different, quite different. You must not make this mistake. This was a diversion that I wanted you to fall into a trap. V0 by Vs is a quantity which can be found out if you know IF because uh, the voltage is simply minus I0 times RC. Okay. I wanted you to identify the A circuit, the beta circuit, find V0 by Vs and Ri and R0. People have made mistakes in this also, even though I worked out several problems and I cautioned you in the class. Okay. The uh, equivalent circuit, if I draw, there have been variations in this answer. Some people have asked me, should I include R0, the uh, collector uh, dynamic resistance. Well, if you include R0, uh, it's not a problem. It's very simple. If you exclude R0, since it was not specified, you might. 
because I didn't specify that ignore Rx, but all of you ignored Rx, didn't you? Okay. So even if you ignore Rx, R0, it doesn't make a, a lot of a difference. My equivalent circuit is Vs Rs, then R pi, V pi, R sub E, Gm V pi, for a moment let us include R0. I will put this in a different color. <coughs> Let us include R0 and we will see what difference does it make. Then uh, <coughs> R sub C and it is obvious that the input voltage is the, the voltage fed to the transistor is what is what voltage appears here minus this voltage and therefore it is a series input connection. It is a series output connection because the feedback voltage is proportional to the current, the load current, not the load voltage. So the architecture is obviously series, series. And the A circuit would be identified by treating Re under this constraint. That is as far as the input is concerned, I shall have to disconnect this. So, I shall have R pi and Re in series. As far as the output is concerned, I shall have to disconnect this line. Therefore, Gm V pi R0, this will come in series with Re. So, the equivalent circuit, equivalent A circuit would be simply Vs Rs. Now, I must use a prime, Vs prime because I am drawing the A circuit. R pi V pi oh I am sorry this comes as Re this line is cut then we have G M V pi I will include R 0 later Re and R sub C I 0. Now <coughs> obviously if I include R0, well, if I exclude R0, if I exclude R0, then obviously I0 equal to Gm V pi, and all that you have to find out is V pi from here. Okay? If I include R0, then I0 is mentally, you do not have to write any equation, or you do not have to uh, refer to an equation from the book, nothing is required. Mentally, you convert this to a Thevenin voltage, Thevenin source. Thevenin equivalent circuit with Gm V pi R0, the voltage in series with R0. Therefore, I0 would be Gm V pi R0 divided by R0 plus Re plus Rc. Okay? It is very simple. And when R0 goes to infinity, obviously this is equal to Gm V pi. And V pi is equal to <coughs> R pi Vs divided by Rs plus R pi plus R e. Okay? And therefore, you can calculate this must be a prime now. You can calculate therefore, A as I 0 prime divided by V s prime. If R 0 is not neglected, then this factor G m R 0 by R 0 plus R e plus R c shall be there. If R 0 is neglected, only G m will come and G m times R pi will come which would be equal to H F E. I asked you to distinguish between the two despite that two of you ignored my, my hint and advice and you used a beta and ended up in a mess because there is another beta here. Okay? So, I would not continue the calculation, but well, let me show the beta circuit. The beta circuit also many people made a mistake because they took the output as V0 output of the A circuit is not V0. Well, if okay, I will come to V0 later. Output of the A circuit is I0 prime okay. and what is fed back is a voltage. So, you find Vf prime plus minus. Obviously, beta is equal to Re. Some people found beta equal to 1 by Re. That is because of that voltage and current mistake. In a series series, as far as the feedback feedback analysis is concerned, you must follow the discipline strictly because anything else you do, you, you make a mistake. Okay. 
So you know beta. Now let me come back here and tell you some other mistakes that you performed. You see my why? Let me go back. This current flows like this and therefore Vf prime and I0 prime agree with each other. If they agree, there is no reason to bring that um, unfortunate <laughs> negative sign. <laughs> okay, so beta is R. Now, <clears throat> there is a problem, there was a problem in identifying the output resistance. Okay, as far as the input resistance is concerned, for the A circuit, A circuit, where is the input resistance? Input resistance is here, not here. If you do that, then you will be making a mistake because you are going to multiply by A beta, 1 plus A beta, right? So this is the output resistance of the A circuit, input resistance of the A circuit. Let us call this Ri prime. Now where is the output resistance to be calculated for the A, A, for the A circuit? Is it here? No, because R sub C has to be absorbed inside the basic amplifier and therefore the output resistance has to be calculated here, okay? It will include Rc and it is obvious that it will be Rc plus R0 plus Re because this is a current generator, okay? This is a mistake many people have done. Sir, but uh, neutron R0 and Ri in the diagram in the paper. Oh, I intentionally confused you. No, no. <laughs> That is not a confusion. Wait a second. I confused you with the with the symbol. Where is the circuit? Sorry. What I did was R zero I showed from the transistor. This is what I want. There is no question of uh, what I should want. You have to subtract us. You have to subtract us. Okay. Should I go on with the calculation of this or uh, it is obvious? Okay. All right. So, uh, I, I repeat that in the analysis of feedback amplifiers, in discipline always costs a heavy lot. You must follow the discipline. Once you identify the architecture, you must work in terms of that architecture only. The output, nature of output is identified, nature of input is identified and RC, the load and the source resistance are both included in the A circuit and therefore in calculating the feedback input resistance or the feedback output resistance, it is the A circuit R0 which has to be multiplied by 1 plus A beta. Yes, you had a question. Yes. For the A circuit. For the A circuit, Ri prime is Rs plus R pi plus Re. That is right. For the A circuit. And therefore, for the for the feedback Ri F prime, it would be Rs plus R pi plus Re multiplied by 1 plus A beta. And the required Ri would be Rif prime minus Rs. That's what it would be. That's fine. Hold it. My A circuit is this, and this is my Ri prime, and therefore the input impedance is Rs plus R pi plus Re. And all that I have to do is to multiply this by 1 plus A beta, nothing else. Of course, Re affects the input impedance and output impedance as well. Re is included in the output impedance. Yes, and then, and then Rif prime, and then Ri. Ri was Rif prime minus Rs. That's right. That is correct. So can you show the output please? Sir? Can I show the output? Yes? So are we taking the output from here or from the top of RC? Yes, sir, from the top of RC. From the top of RC? Yes, sir. Now, sir, if we see, sir, RC will come in parallel. You have forgotten 
that whenever there is a series connection, my ideal amplifier is a short circuited output and R sub C has to be included here. So my output is from these two points. These are my output points which are shorted and therefore R O prime is from here. This is this should not be forgotten. If I had a shunt, if I had a series shunt for example, then then R C also would have gone into the basic amplifier but in shunt in parallel. Whereas since it is a series, since currents are being compared, R C is in series with the top line of the basic amplifier. And R C has to come in the A circuit. Okay? Finally you find R O F prime and subtract R C from there because what you are looking at is here. Okay, now I go to the concluding part of the oscillator. We were on the subject of crystal oscillators and we were on the characterization of a crystal. As I had mentioned, it is a special material, dielectric material, lithium niobate, zinc oxide, I had mentioned another, aluminum nitride and quartz for 100 kilohertz to about 100 megahertz. Quartz is the most popular choice, quartz. It is naturally available. It has also, it can also be grown. It has to be grown in fact, quartz crystal and cut properly. The dimensions are of the order of these are typical dimensions 1 centimeter, 1 centimeter and 10 millimeter and as you know the two faces, two faces are metal coated and electrodes are brought out from there. The whole assembly, the whole assembly a tiny crystal is hermetically sealed in a metal can so that there are no strays, no electrostatic, no magnetic coupling. Ten millimeter. Ten millimeter is one centimeter, is it? Oh, yes, of course. How could I do that? It's of the order of one millimeter. I'm sorry. It's of the order of one millimeter. Yes. Are these the same crystal? No, they have to be specially made and specially cut. Same crystal can be used, but there are problems about losses and these have to be specially grown so that the losses are minimized. As I told you, the electrical equivalent circuit is like this. You have from the metal contacts of the two faces, you have a capacitance we call this C2 and the main bulk of the crystal behaves like it is a mechanical resonance circuit, so it behaves like a series L C1 and there is an incidental dissipation R. There is a dissipation R. This is the equivalent circuit of the crystal. Now if capital R is 0, obviously the Q of the crystal shall be infinite. No losses and therefore the impedance, if you look at the impedance here, Z of J omega this will be purely reactive, this will be equal to Jx if R equals to 0 and therefore the Q which is the reactance divided by resistance would be equal to infinity. Nevertheless, a Q of 1000 is um, very simple to obtain with a quartz crystal. 10,000 Q is a very common thing and a high Q, high Q LC circuit the highest Q that can be obtained is from a crystal. From an ordinary inductor you cannot get that order of that order of Q. If you go to microwaves then of course you use cavity resonators and there also 10,000 Q is not a problem at all. Anyway, let us look at this equivalent circuit from the network theory point of view and let us for a moment ignore capital R. That is let us consider this as a purely reactive circuit C2. 
usually C2 is much greater than C1. Can you guess why? C1 basically is contributed to the by the bulk dielectric, whereas C2 contains the electrostatic coupling between the two metal plates, okay, charges and so on. C1, uh, let us not go deeper into this. C2 also includes the uh, stray capacitances between the two terminals that are brought out and C2 usually is much greater than C1. C1 may be a few pups, C2 may be hundreds of pups <coughs> and this contributes to the characteristic of the crystal. If you take Z here, then Z would be Z, G omega would be purely reactive X and if you plot X versus omega, we will do it by common sense without any uh, analysis, okay? without any analysis. We, we will not do zeros and poles at the moment, we will apply common sense. At very low frequencies, at DC, does this circuit behave as inductive or capacitive? Obviously, it is capacitive. Okay? So, the reactance X shall be negative. Now, at the frequency where L and C1 series resonate, that is at the frequency, uh, let us say omega S equal to 1 over root L C1, the reactance would be 0 because 0 shunts a capacitance and therefore it will be 0. Therefore, it must pass through a 0 like this. Do you know that the slope of a reactance function is always positive? Do you know this or you do not know yet? No, you do not know. Okay, does not matter. Beyond this, you know in series resonance, beyond series resonance, the circuit will become inductive. Okay? So, it goes like this. Now, then how long can it go? How far can it go? Well, if you see, if L, C1 and C2, they series resonate, then the impedance looking here would be what? Infinity. Is not that right? Can I please repeat this? Okay. You see the impedance looking here is J omega L 1 over plus 1 over J omega C 1 divided by, I beg your pardon, let me use an extra sheet, another sheet. My impedance looking here would be J omega L plus 1 over J omega C 1. I did not want to write this expression, but let us let us write it anyway. Multiplied by J omega C 2, 1 by J omega C 2 divided by the sum of the three. Okay. Now, if this is 0, if the denominator is 0, which obviously happens when L resonates with a series combination of C1 and C2, that is if the three components together series resonate, then this would be infinity, this would be infinity and this would occur at omega p equals to 1 over square root L series combination of C1 and C2. So, C1 C2 divided by C1 plus C2. This is from common sense. I am not, I did not want to write this because I thought it should be obvious, but anyway. Okay. So, what happens is this goes to infinity. This goes to infinity at some frequency omega p, where omega p is given by 1 over square root L C1 C2 divided by C1 plus C2. How do you know whether the parallel resonance, this is a parallel resonance, parallel resonance of the circuit, how do you know whether this occurs earlier or later than series? Because you compare these two quantities, omega p is greater than omega s. In fact, if I write this, omega p can be written as 1 over square root L c 1, which is omega s multiplied by square root of 1 plus c 1 divided by c 2. Is that okay? So, this is omega s multiplied by 1 plus c 1 by c 2 to the power half. That is greater than omega s. So, omega p is greater than omega s. I also told you that c 2 is much greater than c 1. 
all right therefore this is approximately omega s 1 plus c 1 divided by 2 c 2 and this is a small quantity in other words omega p and omega s are very close to each other although I have shown it a little exaggerated version very close to each other. Now what happens later what happens beyond parallel resonance beyond parallel resonance the sign of the reactance changes again so from plus infinity it shall come to minus infinity and what happens at infinite frequency when frequencies are very high the inductance appears as an open and therefore the reactance would be approximately 1 by omega c2 capacitive and therefore it shall go to 0 like this this sketch is called a reactance sketch and you shall learn about it in more details in your circuit theory course in due course of time now I have told you omega s and omega p are very close to each other and this is what gives the crystal its high q property and its property of being able to generate very stable oscillations how is it used the crystal is generally used in this range that is when it is inductive now you know that an inductance can be used either in Hartley circuit or in cold pit circuit cold pit circuit requires one inductance and the Hartley circuit requires two inductances accordingly you have two different kinds of crystal oscillators let me draw these circuits then you will then I will explain what these oscillators are <coughs> Okay, in the uh, Hartley circuit what you require is what is the Hartley circuit you have any a capacitance and an inductance to ground and inductance to ground right this is the Hartley circuit two inductors well how I drew in the class is like this this was grounded right now there are two inductors now this goes to the collector of the transistor all right so one of the circuits could be this now look at the practical realization of the circuit instead of connecting it to ground and instead of biasing with a resistance at high frequencies the transistor is connected to a tuned circuit directly to plus VCC which acts which is tuned to behave as an inductance all right you could use an external inductance also but if you want to fine tune the oscillation frequency because the crystal does not offer any tuning is this point clear crystal is a hermetically sealed you cannot you cannot do anything you can add an inductance or a capacitance in parallel but that will deteriorate that will destroy the property of the crystal oscillator because any inductance that you add has a resistance of its own any capacitance that you add has a leakage of its own and it destroys so the crystal should be kept intact any fine tuning that is needed is done by this then I do not know which color is okay then uh, you know the usual REC combination what you want is a capacitance now you see you, you can recognize that from the collector to ground there is an inductance this inductance is realized by this circuit then you need a capacitance this capacitance is supplied by what is this element C mu this capacitance is supplied by C mu if it is not enough you add a capacitance across it okay but usually it is not required this is why this this uh, tuning is required okay and then instead of the third inductance you use the crystal the symbol for a crystal is this this is a crystal so what you do is you connect a crystal from here to here this acts as the inductance the third inductance and the whole circuit oscillates you take the output from here 
to make fine tuning you tune this element. Okay. Is anything else required for operation of this circuit? Is the DC biasing okay? No, it is not okay. What do you need? You need a DC feed to the base. Well, the base is open now as far as DC is concerned and therefore you must supply a DC to the base and it is done by the usual uh, biasing arrangement. You can take the biasing from here a resistance here and a resistance here or you can take it from here. What should I prefer? From collector? No. <laughs> we do not want that. Why not? Because that will come in parallel with CMU. I connect directly from here, but I make some <coughs> other modification. I make some other modification. This is a RF circuit. Now, if I use two resistance here, Obviously, the crystal is going to be shunted by the parallel combination of these two resistances and therefore, what one does is instead of connecting directly, one uses an inductance, a high valued inductance here which we had named as RF choke. Okay? High valued inductance, these do not take part in the oscillation. <coughs> But what they do is effectively across the crystal they permit almost an infinite impedance. Why? If it is high valued inductance then at the frequency of oscillation for AC RB1 and RB2, the parallel combination of would be RB1 plus reactance of the inductance, RB2 plus reactance of the inductance. And <coughs> and the effective loading of the crystal is minimized. Okay. Number 2, even if we use two RF chokes here, well it is not going to reduce the, reduce the loading effect totally because there is an R pi here. Now what do I do? R pi is usually a low resistance of the order of a K or so. I must increase it. So, you take care of this. The AC gain will now be determined by the effective impedance of this divided by the resistance Re. Now, the effective impedance of a parallel LC circuit near resonance is almost infinity. Is not that right? But the fact is that this is not a resonance circuit. It has to be an inductance one should take care that the inductance value is sufficiently large so that omega 0 L divided by Re is of the required value. Okay. This describes, this gives you a single transistor crystal oscillator. <coughs> we shall continue uh, the other circuit next time, that is tomorrow.